Hi there, it's John Pushkar, and I'm here today with another episode to try to keep you safe in the world of fuels and combustion systems. And today, I've got my freshly redone 20 real-life fired equipment and mechanical systems hazards presentation. What I'm showing you here are things that I've accumulated, found to be significant problems for people over the past 40 years, being in and out of over 300 industrial plants and large commercial facilities, and having traveled over 3 million miles to accumulate this stuff for you. So sit back, enjoy, take good notes, email me if you have questions, but let's get started. Over the last 40 years, I've developed and led fuels and combustion equipment safety programs for the largest manufacturers in the world. Today, I'm bringing you knowledge, insights, and best practices about fired equipment and natural gas safety. Over the next few minutes, you'll get the kind of practical, real-life explanations that I've become known for. Hey, so is it clear that this is obviously a hazard? Gee. Why would we think that? Well, maybe because we've actually stepped on banana peels, or other people have, and they told us it wasn't very pleasant. But what about this? What about this fastener that's incorrectly installed? Do you immediately recognize that as a hazard? And what about this gas valve? Do you recognize what's going on here? Do you know that the way this valve handle's positioned and the state of the valve could create a tremendous catastrophe if someone doesn't discover what's really going on here? Stick around, I'm gonna show you why both of these are things that you need to know about and be able to take action about immediately. Today's journey, well, it's gonna take two paths. The first path has to do with fired equipment systems. And although there's a lot of emphasis on boilers, it's not exclusively about boilers, it's about fired equipment in general. We're then gonna go down the piping system path. Well, first of all, do you realize that you need to be on the lookout for recalled and obsolete equipment and components? It's not something we necessarily think about in our day-to-day -day lives, unless, for example, there's some type of car seat recall for little children that's emphasized on the 6 o'clock news. But the Consumer Product Safety Commission has a searchable database, and I've identified a link for you right there. At this database, you'll find a surprising number of fired equipment related items, both residential and light commercial types of items. Unfortunately, you won't find some of the more egregious heavy duty industrial types of recalls there. Things, for example, like this recalled burner management system. These sorts of things have to be researched and an individual manufacturer's website, and even then they make it kind of difficult. But this is a burner management system it's one of a number of them from different manufacturers that have been recalled over time. This is a Honeywell system. You can find this information if you search very carefully at Honeywell's website. And when there are issues that could cause you safety problems, they're not always clearly identified as recalls. Sometimes they're maintenance notices, product service advisories, such is the case here with some Allen Bradley PLCs. Now, PLCs, Programmable Logic Controllers, they're used in a lot of combustion control systems and sometimes as burner management systems. At Allen Bradley's website, if you look carefully, you could find many software issues, firmware issues, where it's suggested that you download the latest to prevent problems that they've discovered. And at the end of the day, I can save you time. I've got a proprietary list if you want to email me. I'll send you what I've accumulated over the past 20 years or so. So now we've talked about recalled components. We've talked about service advisories. What did I mean when I said obsolete? Well, obsolete doesn't necessarily mean unsafe. Obsolete means the manufacturer no longer manufactures that component or no longer supports that component with spare parts. A perfect example here is this Eclipse Veriflame that no longer is manufactured and it's identified by Honeywell that you should install a 7800 series BMS to replace it. This is all well and good, 
but you should know that that's not a plug and play replacement. You don't pull out the Veriflame and plug in in five minutes or so the 7800. It's a wiring redo. You could be down for days getting a hold of what you need and doing the rewiring, doing some testing and commissioning afterwards. This is not something simple that just anyone can do. So you need to be aware also of what might be obsolete within your systems. And again, these are identifiable if you know where to look. Obsolete equipment, it could be a big business continuity risk for you. Could take you out for weeks. Do you have any safety devices that are obviously bypassed or out of service? So hopefully you don't have panels that look like this because that would call into mind many other safety issues you probably have. But for the things that we're going to be discussing in the next few slides, you're going to need to get into that control panel. Unless you're a trained electrician, and you've got the proper PPE, you should be nowhere near the inside of a panel, especially if it's a powered panel and it's not just low voltage control components. How would you identify this? Well, hopefully your panels are properly marked as being combination power and control panels, or there's arc flash protection warnings on them, or some other means to turn the high voltage power off. The things I'm going to be talking about here have nothing to do with needing to have the panel powered. Again, unless you're trained and have the proper PPE, don't go into anything that has high voltage in it. Okay, so we've got this panel open. Wow, look to the left of my picture. So there's alligator clips on terminals. That's usually an obvious indication that someone's installed some temporary bypass wiring in order maybe to do some testing, maybe to keep something running. Don't know, but that's not a good sign. Likewise, if you look to the right, you'll see a wire that's out of the raceway. It's just laying there in the bottom of the panel. All the other wires are neatly tucked into a raceway and they've got wire ties on them. Or maybe you see a wire that's an unusual color compared to the rest of them. It's an unusual thickness or gauge. It doesn't have wire numbers. All the rest of them do. All the rest of them are terminated neatly with stake-ons, but this one just has the insulation stripped off and it's shoved up there under a screw head. All of these things I've discussed here are reasons why you should stop, go get some instrumentation tech or somebody with some experience and knowledge, someone who could read a wiring diagram, and make sure nothing's bypassed before you start that equipment. And you know, sometimes they even leave you notes. Here's a couple of notes left in a panel about safety devices that were bypassed. So if you see notes, read them, pay attention, and act accordingly. Look down right below my picture here. Look at the cardboard stuck into these relays to hold them open. Very, very bad sign. Likewise, to the right of my picture, you'll see a purge timer set to zero. Again, big hazard. These sorts of things should have you to stop, not operate that equipment until these issues are dealt with. And all of the bypass component issues, well, they might not be occurring within the panel. There's even an easier way that people can defeat safety devices, and that's with taking pressure switches and moving them to their minimum positions. If you look on the left here, I've got a combustion air proving switch, and it's set to its minimum setting. This means the fan could be tremendously compromised, or there could be something blocking an air intake, and we'll still be able to run this equipment. Likewise, to my right, a low gas pressure switch set to its minimum setting. When you see switches set like this, something's wrong. Time to throw the penalty flag, go talk to someone. And what about the flu systems? Are they impaired? Look to the right of my picture here. Wow, that's really corroded. It's got holes clear through it. Flu systems can be corroded, they can be damaged, they can have broken or missing components. Let's start off talking about the corrosion issues. What I'm showing you here is a chemical equation for combustion. You can see that when we take methane and we combine it with oxygen, well, we simply make carbon dioxide, water, and heat. This is when the combustion process is working perfectly. 
and you can see evidence of the water production to the right of my photo. You see those white fluffy clouds coming out of that flue stack? Well, that's water vapor. So we've got a lot of moist air coming up and through a typical flue gas stack system. There's a period of time when we start up and all of that moisture is condensing on the insides of that flue gas piping. If the system runs long enough, we dry out the insides of that flue gas piping. But if we cycle frequently, we accumulate that moisture and we have wetted surfaces for prolonged periods of time, which just invites corrosion to attack. One of the leading causes of keeping these systems wetted for prolonged periods of time, well, it's oversized equipment that cycles a lot, doesn't run for long periods of time to give us a chance to dry things out. If you look carefully and find corrosion on your flue gas piping systems, you might have more going on than meets the eye. Try to do some work to see if you've got this excessive cycling oversized equipment issue. And flue piping systems, well, they get damaged as well. See the discoloration above my photo? Well, that's evidence that there was actually a fire going on inside this flue stack. You see, steel starts to change properties when it gets overheated, and one of the things that occurs is that it starts to change color. And if you look to the right, you'll see that the inside aluminum liner of this double-walled stack, well, it actually melted away and made for a blockage. Sometimes we'll get fires on the inside of flue stacks from burners that are out of adjustment or the accumulation of carbon that finally found an ignition source and actually burned. So take a good hard look at your flue piping systems. Make sure you don't see discoloration. And the other thing to look for, well, it's signs that things are broken or missing. To the upper right, quite often I see flue caps that are gone. They've just corroded over time, fell apart, wind's taken them off. Or you might have had bird screening there and it's gone. Below my picture to the right, lots of these systems are mechanical jointed systems. Doesn't take much of somebody bumping into something or a hanger to be misinstalled and the next thing you know, you're leaking at a joint. And to my left here, well, what you're seeing is what's called a barometric relief damper. This is a device that's installed if you actually have too tall of a stack or too much suction in a system. What's supposed to happen is that the little damper there is supposed to only allow air to go in, and it's not supposed to be allowing things to come out. You can see obviously here, though, by the discoloration on that pipe insulation, that there's been flue gases coming out of here for some period of time. This is very dangerous. If we're making carbon monoxide in this piece of equipment, and it's escaping through the barometric relief that's not functioning properly, we could really hurt or kill people. So again, if you've got a barometric relief damper, make sure that it looks like that damper is functioning and that it's just allowing air to go in. And what about the condition of linkages and actuators? So actuators are devices that rotate or that move linearly and that reposition dampers or valves, and quite often they have linkages associated with them. Here's a linkage system installed for firing on a boiler. Quite a common way of controlling fuel and air, especially on some of the older boiler systems. These are called single point parallel positioning controls. So you wanna look very carefully. You see the linkage holder right below my picture? Wow, look, it's just barely holding in that linkage rod. Not a good situation. Likewise, you might have cotter pins that are gone or loose or ready to fall out. Uh, whatever may be the case, watch the linkage cycle. Does it move very smoothly? Is it binding anywhere? Maybe it needs a few drops of lubricant. Grab them, shake them, see if they're ready to fall off. If so, Get somebody who's qualified to evaluate where they should be set and make sure they're set properly. But again, this isn't something that takes an unusual amount of training, for example, to see a linkage holder ready to slip like I'm showing you below my picture. So let's make it even easier for you to spot linkage problems. How about match marking your linkages? 
That's right. Take a Sharpie marker and mark the drive and the driven member. Mark linkage rods before and after they go into a linkage holder. Now you can have as a regular part of your startup routine someone walking by and seeing if anything has moved one piece relative to another. It's an easy way to quickly see obvious problems where you have linkages moving and especially in combustion systems once linkages are set they should never be moved unless something dramatic has changed in the system. And even then, only after careful consideration and measurement of the results by someone who's trained to set up burners. So I've just talked about a number of things that should be evaluated before you even try to start something up. Those things and more should be part of a pre-start walk-down checklist that you create. I used to call this 15 minutes to save your life. And of course, there's many more items than I've just discussed. You could be looking for water leaks, damaged piping systems, and a number of other things that I'm going to yet get to here in this presentation. Get together with your team after you've all watched these episodes and create your own equipment facility specific checklist to use as a walk down startup procedure. And oh yeah, Here's something you should think about. I've investigated dozens of explosions. And in every case, things that are bolted on, well, they fly off. So never stand in front or in back of a boiler system. And nothing replaces distance when it comes to starting something up and trying to be safe. Hi, it's John Pushkar. I hope you found this episode useful. If you'd like to know about more ways that I can help, you can check out my website at www.prescientts.com. There you'll find information about the Prescient Technical Services Online School, my book, Fuels and Combustion System Safety, What You Don't Know Can Kill You, and also about some of the consulting projects that I've been providing to clients for the past 40 years. Things like implementing inspection and testing programs on a corporate enterprise-wide level. Things like reviewing and commenting on capital equipment purchases that involve combustion equipment. And even being a legal expert if things go really wrong. Once again, thank you for attending. And remember, be safe out there. The life you save, it just might be yours.